back at Investor Tattles headquarters in San Diego, California. I'm your host, Daniel Wong. On today's program, we have managing member of Bevilacqua PLLC, Lou Bevilacqua, on with us today. He is a corporate securities attorney and a specialist in the equity crowdfunding sp uh, space, as well as a thought leader. Lou, thanks so much for taking the time with us. Thank you, Daniel. So, Lou, one of the biggest topics right now, and it's a very hot topic, is what is equity crowdfunding? There's been some rules and regulation changes, but can you really explain us what is equity crowdfunding? Sure. Um, equity crowdfunding, unlike donation-based crowdfunding, which you see on Kickstarter or Twitter, is where you're selling securities. And there are three basic things that people call equity crowdfunding. The first is where you can raise up to a million dollars from both accredited and non-accredited investors under regulation crowdfunding in Title III of the Jobs Act. The second is Rule 506C, which is a private placement, just like regular old traditional private placements under 506B, but you can add to that the ability to advertise and generally solicit accredited investors, but of course you have to take additional steps to verify that they're accredited. And finally, the third thing that people call equity crowdfunding is uh, public offerings of securities under Regulation A, which is commonly known as Regulation A+. Well, then let's go through each of those various types of, of equity crowdfunding. Can, can you start off with, uh, say, Title III? Okay, so Title III, I'm, I'm really excited about Title III because I work with a lot of early stage companies and raising a million dollars is the hardest money that they can ever raise. And so it gives them the ability to get out of the venture capital loop, get out of the angel loop and actually go to the crowd and try to raise money. So with Title III, basically what you have to do is you prepare and file with the SEC what's called a Form C. A Form C is kind of like a private placement memorandum, but it's shorter. So if a private placement memorandum is 50 pages, maybe a Form C is 30 pages. Um, you do have to get uh, reviewed financial statements if you plan on raising over $100,000 or if it's your second um, Title III equity raise. Um, but basically, you prepare this Form C, you file it with the SEC. The SEC does not review it, so there's no regulatory delay waiting for you know, comments with the SEC to be cleared. And then you post your offering on one of, there are about 15 now, um, qualified portals. These qualified portals are actually FINRA members. So FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, <clears throat> now in addition to regulating broker-dealers, also regulates funding portals. And so you have to post your deal on one of these portals and you can post the video, you can post pictures, you can post your company summary, a PowerPoint deck. Of course, you post your Form C um, and your transaction documents, and then you can advertise and you can drive traffic to the portal. There are certain limits on what you can and can't say in the advertising, but basically you can do social media, you can post information on your website, you can do direct mail, you can you know, get influencers or bloggers to help you promote your offering, and you drive all the traffic to the portal, and then people can decide whether they want to make an investment or not. And if they do, uh, they basically click on a link, put in a bunch of information, sign the documents electronically, and then they could wire the money or ACH the money, excuse me, from their bank account. So they just put their bank account information, and the money comes right out of their bank account. So it makes life really easy for the investors. Um, and really facilitates the offering process. Definitely a, a big change. So now that you've mentioned that, let's explain how normally these things would happen. I mean, why is that such a, a big difference from the way it was traditionally being raised? That's a great question. So, you know, traditionally in raising that first million dollars, which like I said, is always the hardest money to raise, um, you'd have, you know, the entrepreneur going out to friends and family uh, maybe the entrepreneur would pitch in an angel event, or if if they're really lucky, they'd find the VC who's interested in their company. Uh, in any of those cases, they'd be sending documents back and forth. Um, at some point, maybe they'd get non-binding indications of interest through people signing a term sheet, then they follow up with documents. And it's just a very disjointed process where you have to keep following up with people, and not, not everything is in one place. And so... Um, the other problem, of course, is that you could never advertise and get non-accredited investors in. So one of the big differences about Title III is that you can not only sell, you know, sell to your high net worth friends and family, but you can sell, you know, to your your friends and family who may not have that kind of money to invest, and they could support you by just putting a few hundred dollars into your offering. So uh, it, it really is a, a 
a big change in the, in the way you know entrepreneurs are able to raise that first million dollars. Well, obviously, it's opening it up uh, so many other channels and opportunities for investors. So, where do you see that going? I mean, uh, people have talked about you know obviously uh, looking at a lot more different people to raise the money from. Are there some ways to raise it traditional alongside of, of this platform? What are some other some other opportunities for companies, and, and what do you recommend depending on which companies and amount raise? Yeah, it's it's not exclusive, and so remember, with Title Three, you're talking about small amounts from a lot of people. So. The uh, minimum investment could be as low as $100. A lot of times the maximum investment will be $107,000, which is um, the, the maximum you can raise under Title III is actually increased to one million seventy thousand. so it's 10% of that. Um, and so one of the things you might want to do is simultaneous with your Title III offering, um, raise capital in a 506C private placement. And you could uh, you could drive traffic from accredited investors to your 506c private placement and raise more than a million seventy thousand dollars. And you could drive the non non accredited investors to your Title III platform. And so you know that's a way for your same marketing dollars to you know benefit two times. It definitely, you can have that hybrid approach. I think, which is be very interesting to companies to at least have the opportunity to do both. Uh, right. Let's talk about 506C then, and take us through that as an option for companies. So 506C, I mean, forever we've been doing private placements, and you know, you have to keep everything confidential. You can only go out to people you have a pre-existing relationship with, or you could bring a broker dealer in to act as a placement agent, go out to their accounts. Um, you could never post anything on your website. You could never use social media. You couldn't leverage your client base or your supplier base or any affinity group. And so what happened was in September of 2013, Rule 506C became effective. And that now allows you to generally solicit and generally advertise your offering, your 506C private placement. Um, the problem with that, the only problem is that what the SEC said is, we're no longer going to allow investors to self-certify by checking through an accredited investor questionnaire. Instead, we're going to require issuers to or the company to verify that these investors are accredited. So the most common way of verifying that an investor is accredited is by getting uh, their lawyer or accountant to sign uh, a letter saying, look, we've done the requisite due diligence and we certify that you know, this investor is accredited. Another way, though, could be to do it for the company to do it on their own and, and, and ask for W-2 or tax return or some other item to verify income or a bank statement to verify assets. And the problem with that is it's hard enough to get um, investors to sign documents and send you money. And now you're asking for a letter from their lawyer or a tax return. And it just makes it that much more harder more difficult to get a deal done. Uh, there are a bunch of services out there that are trying to make that process easier and they're getting some traction. Um, but I think it's just going to take time before investors are used to the fact that they have to get this le letter from their lawyer or provide additional information to verify that they're accredited. I think that makes sense. It's probably a good idea. It reminds me of the the mortgage days where someone had a good enough credit score, they could just do a stated loan and, and basically uh, tell you what they made without any verification. So obviously understand the parameters that want to be fixed there. Let's now go into Reg A+. That's probably the, the most you know newly defined uh, regulations there, and companies are using this to do IPOs or to do other traditional raises. Tell us more about that. Sure. So Reg A+, plus is very similar to a traditional IPO or public offering. Um, two main differences. In a, uh, in a traditional public offering, there's a quiet period. So before you file your registration statement, you cannot talk about the deal at all. Um, they made changes recently to say that you can speak to institutional accredited investors during the quiet period, but that's pretty much it. You certainly can't post anything on your website or do a direct mailing or advertise your that the fact that you plan to do a public offering. Um, with Regulation A, there's this ability to test the waters. And so what that means is even before you file an offering statement, and even if you never file an offering statement in the future, you're allowed to go out and say, you know, we're planning on raising money under Regulation A, and this is what we do. And if you're interested, you know, 
reserve a dollar amount that you think you might want to invest. It's non-binding. Um, and give us your email address. And there's a specific legend you have to put on all advertising to be compliant with the laws. But what it does is it gives the issuer the ability to see whether they're going to be able to get any traction in their reggae offering. So before they spend a lot of money on lawyers and accountants and marketing, um, they can do a test and see whether this is the kind of thing that will be well received by the market. And that's something you can't do in an IPO. The other the other difference is in a, in a tier two regulation A offering, um, the state blue sky laws are preempt. So you may have to make notice filings, but you're not going to have to go through a review with state regulators. So if you're doing a public offering and you're not not going to be listed on NASDAQ and you're going to be listed on the over-the-counter market, then you'd have to also potentially go through a state review in many of the states where you sell securities. And that could be very costly and time-consuming. So those are two real benefits. But otherwise, it's very similar to a public offering. You file something called an offering statement instead of a registration statement, but they look you know, very similar. The the information required is slightly less than in an offering statement than a registration statement. But you go through the same process where you file it with the SEC, you respond to SEC comments, you file amendments and response letters until at some point you're cleared, and then you it's called qualified as opposed to going effective in the Regulation A parlance. And at at that point, once you're cleared, you can actually start selling securities and taking in funds. I think the test of waters is probably one of the most you know interesting facets of it. Being able to actually test the waters and advertise to before you spend that money. Uh, you know, speaking of these you know crowdfunding campaigns and, and equity crowdfunding, you've actually been helping a company called uh, uh, Bunny Bravo. There, we'd like you to maybe explain a little bit about what you do for them, or or kind of use this as an example to uh, explain equity crowdfunding to everyone. Yeah, sure. This is a, a great example. Um, this is a Title Three regulation crowdfunding campaign, and uh, Michael Simka, who's the founder of uh, Bravo Bunny, which is the name of the LLC, um, is basically creating uh, an animated film that's going to be called The Adventures of, of Bunny Bravo, and uh, there's going to be a, a companion film in Spanish. And what, what Michael does is he reversions films, so he'll go to... Uh, Russia or China or India, and he'll acquire rights to edit the film and and put um, you know new actor voices in and 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 add a new musical score and and cut out scenes that he doesn't want to be in there. And so basically, you know, within four months, he can have a fully baked animated film that he's now done in English from Russian or Chinese. And because of his relationships with Nickelodeon and Disney actors, he can bring really, really good talent uh, to the film. And so uh, The Adventures of Bunny Bravo is an example of that where um, he's gotten rights to re to edit the film, you know, put in the new voices. And so the film is, is done. It's done already. Um, he just needs money for marketing. And one of the great things about this is each of these actors that are appearing in the film, they all have a lot of followers on, um, you know, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on on all different all different kinds of medium. And so when they go out and talk about this deal, it, it drives a lot of traffic to uh, to the uh, website and and uh, allows him to raise the capital he needs to get this done. I definitely would like to check up on that and see how the progress goes. It's a, I think it's a great example. A lot of people try to figure out you know what companies are, are a good candidate for this type of funding. And I think things with a fan following uh, and definitely that viral sense where you can share it amongst a lot of people seem like a good fit so far. Absolutely. I think any, any kind of company that has an affinity group uh, would be good for Title Three and crowdfunding generally. Uh, I think films and and uh, theatrical productions and and books and things like that, um, uh, all the better because you can just generate a lot of a lot of interest in it. And I think we've seen that so far. Uh, we've seen Legion M. We've seen you know quite a few other other companies do the same thing. But um, Lou, that's all the time we have for today. But I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to you know give us some information, explain to us more about equity crowdfunding. We'll uh, definitely have you on again soon, sometime. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. 
Well, everyone, that was Lou Bevilacqua, managing member of Bevilacqua PLLC. If you're looking for some assistance in the equity crowdfunding space, uh, go to bevilacquapllc.com. Thanks so much, everyone. Tune in to our uh, YouTube channel as well as our Facebook, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks so much.